I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. Carla Camacho Soto is a senior scientist at Merck. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. So today I'm going to be giving a brief overview of a, a program that we currently have in the pipeline here at MSD, in which we had to um, we were able to improve the chemistry by combining enzyme engineering, enzyme immobilization, and flow chemistry. So the protein engineering group uh, here at MSD has a mission to enable the discovery and development of new active pharmaceutical ingredients by inventing and enhancing the protein function. So we could do this by leveraging a diverse uh, team skill sets and modalities that allow us to accelerate the development of biocatalysts and uh, protein and peptide therapeutics. So our group is divided into three main areas. Uh, one of the biggest areas is enzyme engineering, which will be the focus of, of my talk today. Uh, we also have a, a significant portion of our group devoted to be able to discover the next generation therapeutic uh, through protein engineering and also some uh, new technology development to help uh, support the next generation engineering programs. So the protein engineering group here at MSD is composed of 19 scientists. We have a diverse uh, skill sets uh, in terms of, uh, of, of the different areas that we could impact within the group. We have molecular biologists, we have modeling and informatics, chemists, biochemists, uh, and biologists. And by having this synergistic between all the different uh, areas, this allows us to speed up the, the discovery of new enzymes or therapeutic uh, proteins through directed evolution. So why we're so interested in using biocatalysts uh, with commercial applications? So if you think about uh, enzymes, there are several different advantages and disadvantages of using enzymes as biocatalysts. Some of the biggest advantages of, of enzymes as biocatalysts is that they are extremely specific for the reactions that they perform. They're really efficient catalysts. They tend to operate under really mild uh, reaction conditions. They're non-toxic and they have a, a lot less environmental impact than a traditional uh, chemo uh, catalyst. They also have the ability to reduce uh, the cost of final manufacturing uh, processes compared to other traditional uh, chemical catalysts. Likewise, we could think about some of the disadvantages and why we need protein engineering to address some of those. So some, most of the enzymes have a very limited substrate scope. Uh, they're really uh, fragile uh, in terms of that they need to operate under very specific environmental conditions, such as temperature and pH. And any changes, very small changes in those conditions could be very detrimental for the activity of, of the biocatalyst. Therefore, if we um, uh, employ directed evolution, we are able to solve some of these biggest disadvantages to still uh, keep uh, enzymes as attractive biocatalysts for manufacturing purposes. So here uh, at MSD, our protein engineering group practice the design, make, and test uh, cycle. So by leveraging our uh, informatic teams, we could um, design different libraries uh, based on, on very specific uh, points that we want to explore in our enzymes of interest. Then by leveraging our high throughput screen experimentation, we could uh, start um, expressing a, a large number of, of variants within libraries. Then we, we have to select some type of testing um, for the uh, activity uh, of, of the enzyme uh, interested in, in studying. Uh, we, we could use either uh, colorimetric, fluorimetric, or um, HPLC-based um, detection. We also have our own NGS sequencing facilities that allow us to link um, what kind of mutations are present based on the activity uh, data that we gather. So we can take all these different pieces of information and build uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that allow us to design the next uh, uh, generation cycle of of, in our directed evolution programs. So for today, I will, give, I will be giving a brief overview of the MK1026 program. This uh, small molecule um, we recently acquired from RQ in 2020. So it's intended to treat um, um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and not Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, it's well known to be a reversible inhibitor of the proton tyrosine kinase and is currently in phase two of clinical trials.
So um, this MK1026 uh, inhibitor was designed to address some of the treatment resistance that has been uh, well reported in literature uh, within BTK. So the standard of care uh, for patients uh, having um, different type of, of leukemias is uh, ibrutinib at, this, uh, at the moment. So ibrutinib is a reversible inhibitor of BTK. Um, it will covalently modify this cysteine 481 um, in the active side. Um, and it's very well known that uh, a mutation can happen in this cysteine uh, 481 to a serine, and that renders ibrutinib essentially um, out of the scope of the uh, therapeutic um, regime because now it, it won't be able to commonly modify um, the cysteine in the active site. On the other hand, we design, we specifically design uh, MK1026 to be able to still inhibit BTK regardless of the amino acid present in position 481, which will give us the advantage of uh, even though some patients will contain this uh, C481 serine uh, uh, as a mutation, we will still be able to inhibit BTK in those cases. So when the uh, when when MSD acquired um, Arkil in 2020, there was a, a a proposed route for the synthesis of MK1026 uh, from three different chemical commodities, um, uh, three different chemical commodities. And one of the things that brought our was brought to our attention early on in the synthesis process was this uh, particular uh, piece of information uh, of, to, to achieve this amino alcohol piece. And um, it was clear that we we needed to, we would like to have a better uh, uh, synthesis step in this process because the overall yield for this uh, particular transformation was only about 37% yield and it required a total of nine different uh, synthetic steps um, in order to achieve the amino alcohol piece. So in some of the brainstorming sessions that we had uh, when, when we started working in this program, one of our team members uh, found out about uh, styrene. So styrene, uh, this molecule as shown here, um, it's actually used as a, or as a, as a green and renewable solvent. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's produced from the uh, uh, pyrolysis of, of wood chips, and it's a uh, relatively uh, cheaper compared to the initial uh, chemical commodity that, that, that was used in the initial synthesis route. So um, we did a little bit of, of research uh, scouting and we found out that sirene could be converted to this uh, keto alcohol piece um, uh, by a chemical catalysis. And then if we think about uh, other possible um, synthesis that we could do, we could essentially uh, use a reductive amination either biocatalytically or chemocatalytically to achieve the amino alcohol piece of our um, molecule. So that will reduce uh, the total number of steps uh, used from uh, nine to only three from a, a chemical commodity that is a lot cheaper than the initial um, starting material um, proposed by, by the initial synthesis from RQ. So we went ahead and, and started uh, investigating several different routes for the synthesis of these uh, amino alcohol piece. And um, whether we started doing the ring opening first and then transamination or doing the transamination first and then the ring opening. And at the end, we decided to go with the transamination first because it will allow us to use uh, enzymes, uh, doing, doing the enzyme evolution using a chemical commodity, uh, but also will allow us to access a very stable and crystalline amine salts with high uh, selectivity um, compared to the initial route if we if we try to do the ring opening first and then um, the transamination as a second step. So early on, we, de we decided to do the transamination uh, um, step first, and um, uh, we started talking about whether to use chemocatalysis or biocatalysis, and we decided to, uh, to set in the biocatalytic route. So transaminases are uh, very well known in literature. Uh, they have been commonly used uh, to achieve really high in antipure products um, within the literature. So these enzymes uh, uh, tend to form uh, homodimers and they require PLP uh, for, for catalysis. So in terms of the mechanism of, of, of uh, transaminases, the PLP will form uh, uh, internal aldimine with the, the, it will react with the, uh, the amino um, side chain of a lysine to form this internal aldimine. Um, um, intermediate, uh, 
which re also requires this amine donor and through several steps of, of um, um, several steps, it will be able to transfer these amine donor, uh, I mean, from, from the amine donor into the um, um, ketone acceptor uh, to achieve your amine product. Um, so all these those reactions happen in equilibrium, um, as shown in the in the mechanism um, to your right. So one of the first questions we had is, can we identify a, an initial starting point for evolution that is able to accept uh, this uh, relatively bulky uh, starting material? So we had in hand, uh, in collaboration with Codexis, uh, a transaminase panel. Um, that we screen against styrene. Um, most of the transaminases in this panel require isopropyl amine as the amine donor uh, to achieve our product of interest and, and in the process generate acetone. Um, so from the initial screening, we identified five different uh, enzymes that were able to convert styrene into styrene amine. However, upon further investigation, we saw that even though most of these enzymes were able to reach high conversions, uh, the selectivity for the desired product was significantly reduced. Um, one of the enzymes that also caught our attention is this ATA426 that even though was providing the desired product with, uh, was providing uh, reactivity uh, at a lower uh, assay yield, it was still giving us a better selectivity profile compared to the other one, to the other enzymes in the same panel. Um, so we decided to uh, set uh, ATA-426 as our starting point for the evolution, and we set our evolution goals uh, to be able to improve the enzyme activity, improve the selectivity um, as much as possible, being able to push the enzyme to tolerate higher substrate loads. Uh, and at the end, we also decided to improve the thermal stability of the enzyme, as I'm going to be explaining later, um, once we switch from doing most of the reactions in the in, in uh, free uh, solution to immobilization. So our evolution strategy, as I mentioned before, we could leverage high throughput screening platform for screening a really large number of mutations. So in the initial rounds of evolution, what we normally do is we uh, we take we take our modeling and informatic uh, team and and they divide our protein of interest into several different uh, libraries. So we, we built libraries based on, on residues surrounding the active site that we know are gonna be good for um, activity and uh, selectivity, but also uh, we, we divide uh, the protein um, to target uh, residues around the surface and the core that will be uh, good for thermal stability and solvent tolerance. Um, so by uh, screening several different libraries, we identify mutations uh, that are going to be beneficial for the property to be interrogated, and then we could accelerate the um, the evolution process by recombining all those beneficial mutations uh, into combinatorial libraries. So throughout the process of the evolution, we also apply uh, different pressures such as temp uh, temperature uh, challenges, uh, solvent uh, or co-solvent additions, um, as well as trying to push the enzyme to be able to uh, process larger amounts of substrates at, at, at a given time. Um, and then that allows us to find variants that uh, at the end should be able to operate under the desired process conditions. So with this goal in mind, we started our um, evolution for the first round uh, based on ATA-426, uh, using ATA-426 as our starting point. Um, and we decided to focus on the first round of evolution, finding diversity that was uh, beneficial for activity. So we screened our three different libraries uh, from residues surrounding the active site, the surface, and the core. And here I'm showing the improvements in activity that we observed compared to our uh, positive control, in this case, ATA-426. Um, so we identified the best hits from all the three libraries shown uh, to your left. And we decided to focus on, on, on choosing a new backbone for the next, next round of evolution. So we went with this um, A5L mutation, which is in close proximity to the active site based on our modeling, um, uh, based on our models. Um, that, and that gave us around three uh, fold improvements over the positive control compared to ATA426. Uh, so using all the diversity that we generated from the other libraries, we built a combinatorial library from the second round of evolution. And uh, from this uh, library, we are still trying to improve the enzyme activity uh, at this point. So for this new uh, 
combinatorial library based on the mutations that we found from the round one of evolution, we were able to get our best hit uh, to include these six added mutations. And um, this particular hit uh, was uh, around nine times more improved in activity compared to our um, A5L mutant. So most of these mutations can be found uh, surrounding the active site, uh, but also along the um, dimer interface and some of them in the core of the protein. So up to this point, we were working under really diluted conditions uh, and at a relatively low uh, enzyme load. And since the enzyme activity was significantly improved uh, during the first two rounds of evolution, for the third round of evolution, we decided to tackle improving the selectivity. So for the first two rounds of evolution, we our uh, selectivity was around 10 to 1 and then improved to 15 to 1 in the second round of evolution. So for the third round of evolution, we um, uh, screen a site saturation library uh, from residues surrounding the active site, and we found this V69A mutation in very close proximity to the uh, PLP cofactor within the active site that was that was able to give us a, a selectivity of 50 to 1, so that's like a two-fold improvement in selectivity compared to the previous uh, round backbone. During this screening, we also decreased the enzyme load that we were using from 5% to 2.5%, and then increase the concentration of starting material that we were using from uh, 20 grams per liter to 50 grams per liter. So with this information in hand from this uh, site saturation library that we generated, and as the process conditions were constantly changing throughout the, the evolution, for the fourth uh, round of evolution, we decided to tackle uh, the thermal stability of the enzyme. So one of the things that became uh, pretty clear uh, early on in the evolution is that uh, we want to move from running the reactions in aqueous uh, solvent to uh, trying to immobilize the, the enzyme in, in the presence of organic solvents. And in order to do so, we need to make sure that our enzyme is pretty robust in the presence of organic solvents uh, and also being able to operate at temperatures a lot higher than 45 degrees, uh, which are the around 60 degrees is the temperature that we will normally run immobilization reactions. So for this round of fourth of evolution, we went back to the original uh, site saturation libraries and then identify, subjected the, all the variants to a heat challenge and then identify what mutations were still able to retain activity even after the heat challenge test. So we took, took those mutations and uh, built a combinatorial library and screen uh, and, and found the best heat to be these, uh, containing these extra added mutations. Um, so most of these mutations, uh, as you can see from the diagram on the left, are uh, are within the core of the protein and the surface of the protein. Um, so one of the key uh, the questions that we had uh, throughout the, the evolutions that we were running is where most of the mutations uh, lie within the active site and how that um, is uh, giving us some information on, on the improvements in activity and selectivity that we're seeing. So the di diagrams here shown on your left um, is the the is showing the active site of ATA 426, which was our initial starting point for the evolution. And then uh, to your right, you could see the round five backbone, which is one of the most uh, evolved variants that we found throughout the evolution. And as one of the, the key things that we observe is that with ATA 426, we have really uh, bulky and um, hydrophobic residues within the active site that might not necessarily been able to accommodate the siren uh, in the correct position within the active site. And, and as we run uh, through several rounds of evolution, we um, changed uh, the strip to 124 for a, a glycine, this valine 69 for an alanine, and this isoleucine for a methionine. And by doing so, we uh, essentially changed the orientation that the siren uh, takes into the active site, um, therefore providing a better selectivity profile and activity profile throughout the evolution. So one of the questions that we had uh, throughout the rounds of evolution, as I mentioned before, is we do all this experimentation in a high throughput uh, fashion. And if we want to do uh, large uh, commercial applications with any of these enzymes, we need to uh, do large scale fermentation. Um, but before we do that, we like to uh, test uh, all the different variants in our lab in a shape class powder scale. So these are uh, one liter expressions that we could do in the lab and then take uh, the, the um, shake flask powders that contain our protein of interest plus all the other whole cell proteins from, from our uh, host uh, cells 
and then test them under relevant process conditions. And overall, what we were able to see is that we improved the enzymatic activity of about, at about two and a half fold uh, under the process conditions. Uh, but we also were able to improve the selectivity of the enzyme around fivefold. And uh, at the end, we were also able to improve the uh, stability of the enzyme at about uh, 11 degrees Celsius, which allowed us to be able to run these reactions at higher temperatures uh, than what we were running uh, in solution. Um, so one of the key uh, issues that we that transamination uh, reactions presents is that um, at least for, for the siren that, that we were working on uh, early on doing um, doing screenings and checking for byproduct formations in the reactions, we identified that um, by running the reactions in aqueous uh, solvents, styrene um, is converted to styrene amine, and in the process, our um, amine donor gets converted to acetone. And by running these reactions in aqueous environment, um, there's a, this uh, aldol impurity that forms uh, in which acetone will uh, um, react with their siren in the presence of water. And then this accounted for around 15 to 20% of the acid yield that we were seeing, which is a significant uh, impurity that we want to try to avoid as much as possible um, during the reaction. So one of the things that we uh, implemented in the process was trying to do a, a nitrogen sparge in the reaction. In that way, you can remove most of the acetone uh, in the in the reaction, and you also decrease the, these aldo impurity formation uh, significantly. Uh, the second challenge uh, of running these reactions in 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 uh, aqueous solvent is that the siren amine product is very soluble in in um, in in water. Therefore, it will make very difficult uh, downstream processing of removing the enzyme uh, while trying to also isolate uh, the siren amine from the same. Um, um, aqueous stream. So that's why uh, we ended up uh, thinking about can we immobilize, uh, can we employ immobilization to enable uh, the transamination reaction to happen in the presence of organic solvents, because that will allow us to isolate the siren amine from the organic stream, but also it will allow us to not having to worry about um, removing the enzyme because the enzyme will be trapped in the solid support, and then we could easily uh, isolate the siren amine from the organic stream. So one of the uh, key things that we, we consider doing immobilization is whether we want to do immobilization in a specific fashion or using non-specific immobilization. So we decided to do non-specific immobilization because there are uh, several commercially available uh, and, and cheap uh, resins uh, to our disposition. Um, this uh, type of immobilization, it will, um, it will happen through hydrophobic, hydrophilic uh, interactions depending on the surface chemistry of the resin uh, to be used. We had some experience in the past um, developing a similar process for acetic lifting um, here at MSD. Um, and quickly, the immobilization process, how it works is uh, we will have our enzyme of interest uh, mixed with, with the resin of, of interest uh, in some type of buffer in the presence of PLP. So the enzyme will uh, bind to the pores of the, of the resin and then you could do several washes to remove any unbound resin while maintaining uh, the resins inside the pores uh, intact. And then we could do several uh, solvent washes uh, to uh, exchange from an aqueous environment to an organic uh, environment while maintaining some, um, some uh, water content within the pores of, of, the, of the resin so we don't dehydrate and, and, and kill the enzymatic activity. So we have several options that we explore uh, for the transamination reaction. As I mentioned before, the initial one was running all the reactions in water, and I um, um, and it turns out to be a really challenging uh, uh, process to do um, in terms of how do we remove the acetone to prevent a byproduct formation and push the, the conversions to higher levels. Uh, the second option was to do immobilization, but still running the reactions uh, in a batch reaction that allow us to significantly reduce uh, the aldo byproduct formation and we, needed, we did not need to do acetone removal. However, that required multiple unit operations uh, for the enzyme immobilization um, and conditioning of the resin before we could start running the reaction. Ultimately, we uh, ended up uh, using a combination of immobilization uh, in, uh, with a packed bed reactor. And there are several different advantages of uh, 
using a packed bed reactor. So it reduces the, the handling of the resin uh, because now you could condition uh, you could condition and, and do the reaction in, in a single vessel. So essentially we take the our protein of interest in mobilize and then pack that into a column. And then by doing that, we could control how much of the substrate the enzyme is seen at any given time. And uh, because you're constant, constantly flowing um, substrate, uh, that the product is, is being uh, collected into a different area. So you don't need to worry about acetone formation because the acetone is being removed as, as, as quickly as it, as it is formed. Um, by having the enzyme in a packed bed reactor, we also significantly uh, improve the reaction efficiency because now you have more units of enzyme uh, versus the concentration of your starting material running through uh, your packed bed reactor. So in terms of how this process look like at the small milligram scale in the lab, here I'm showing uh, some of the uh, optimization experiments that uh, the chemistry team was able to do. Um, so essentially we will take our uh, enzyme of interest and then immobilize in this uh, small column that you could see here, that's about five mil uh, column. And then through a series of pumps, we could pump uh, our starting materials uh, through the column and then collect all these fractions. Uh, and then by UV detection, we could see how much of the uh, starting material we have remaining, how much product and how much byproducts are formed throughout the reaction. So initially we did these experiments at the uh, lab, um, small milligram scale in the labs and with excellent uh, stability of, of, of the ATA-426, which was our initial uh, starting point enzyme. Um, so we decided to take these reaction one step forward to our prep labs. Um, in this case, we were able to, to process about one kilogram of material in about 44 hours. So from the equipment setup, we have our reaction vessel containing the sirene, isopropyl amine, and isopropyl acetate, which is our solvent of choice uh, uh, initially. Then we will pump that through uh, our column that contains the immobilized enzyme. And then similarly to what we did in the lab scale, we will collect uh, different fractions uh, that contain uh, the product and some of the starting re remaining starting material. And then uh, all that will be collected in this car carboid uh, for downstream processing. So using this 1.7 liter uh, column, we were able to process one kilogram of material in about two days which is, uh, is, is, not, uh, is not bad, but, but there are several things that we were uh, able to improve in the process um, after uh, employing the initial enzyme. So we were running uh, evolutions uh, in parallel as, uh, small, as some of these experiments of, of immobilization were happening. And one of the things that we, we, we were um, asked uh, was whether as we were in, uh, evolving most of these enzymes in aqueous environment, whether they will, are going to be able to translate in the immobilized uh, system. And here I'm showing to your left uh, one of the, our most evolved variants, ATA-492 versus uh, the ATA-426, which is our starting point. And quickly what we could see is that in order for ATA-426 to ach achieve really high conversions, it requires uh, about, three, uh, about uh, 90 minutes. Uh, sorry, about three hours to, to reach uh, about 80% conversion. However, with one of the most evolved variants that we had in the evolution, we were able to significantly cut down uh, the amount of time that the enzyme requires to, to be able to achieve high conversions from three, three hours to only 90 minutes. So that's a significant decrease in the number of hours that we need to uh, operate our uh, enzyme in order to achieve a similar amount of product formation. Um, so one of the, the other uh, questions that, uh, one of the, another issue that arises during the, the um, evolution and immobilization is that we, we significantly see a drop in the selectivity of the enzyme throughout immobilization. So essentially here, I'm showing the, the selectivity profile in solvent, and as I showed before, we were seeing, we, we saw that during the evolution, we were able to significantly improve the selectivity of the enzyme. However, upon immobilization, some of that selectivity was uh, significantly lost. And we did a, a several different experiments to determine why, what factors influence the, the, the significant drop in, in DR that we're seeing. So we're switching from solvents from aqueous to organic. We're also switching temperatures from 
uh, 45 degrees uh, all the way up to 60 degrees. We're changing the reaction times, we're changing enzyme variants. And what uh, became uh, clear from some of the experiments that we run, the first thing that we decided to tackle is whether the solvent has uh, something to do with this significant drop in DR in the selectivity. And so we explored a bunch of different solvents, and here I'm showing the, the um, um, acid yield and, and selectivity profile for two different solvents. So in red and yellow, you could see the yield for uh, the enzymatic activity for one of the evolved uh, variants. Um, we could see that uh, regardless if you use isopropyl acetate or 2-methyl-THF, we could still uh, achieve really high conversions with the enzyme. However, when we look at the selectivity profile, we see that isopropyl acetate uh, provides a lower um, selectivity compared to the methyl THF. So we know that the, the solvent has some effects in the selectivity that we are seeing compared to what we are seeing in aqueous uh, solution. Moreover, for some of the variants, we also see, uh, see this trend that by increasing the temperature of the reaction, we are able to uh, retain some of the selectivity that we observe um, in the aqueous uh, reactions as well. Um, So the third thing that we decided to explore with, was whether um, the type of, of resin chemistry had any impact in the activity and the selectivity of the enzyme. So doing uh, several different batch experimentations with several uh, different resin chemistry, uh, surface resin, uh, surface chemistries in, in different resin, we could quickly identify that the, the selectivity doesn't significantly change uh, regardless of the resin that we use. However, we noticed that for um, amine derivatized uh, type of resins, in this case, this ECR8415, uh, we were able to achieve higher um, uh, levels of activity because uh, uh, these amine functionalized resins preferentially absorb uh, our protein of interest over the host of proteins. So therefore you get more, uh, more of your protein of interest uh, um, immobilized compared to the host of proteins uh, through the through the process. Um, so we quickly uh, did the, the the two changes that I just presented: switch solvents from isopropyl acetate to methyl THF, and then change the the resin that we were initially using in the process. Um, and then went back and see how these in, these uh, changes will improve the final uh, process conditions. And what you can see here is for ATA-426 in the initial uh, resin that we were using, as I mentioned before, it requires about three hours in order to achieve higher levels of conversions. However, with the most uh, evolved uh, variant using the same resin, we were able to cut down uh, the, the amount of time that it was required to achieve higher levels of conversion from three hours to only 90 minutes. And then by introducing uh, this new resin chemistry um, we were able to cut down the, the residence time even further from um, 90 minutes to only 45 minutes. Um, so by doing these, all, all these improvements in the process efficiency, this gave us a more sustainable process uh, for a large manufacturing uh, scale. So we took these, uh, these two uh, changes of resin and changes in solvent and changes in the evolved variants and went back to the prep lab scale. Um, in this, uh, this time around, we were able to run the reactions uh, in a one liter column instead of the 1.7 liter column that we initially had. We were able to process 3.1 kilograms of starting material compared to only one kilogram at the very beginning. Uh, and we were still able to retain really high levels of conversions of about 84% as a yield with, uh, with excellent uh, selectivity in the process. So how this process will end up looking like uh, in a manufacturing uh, pilot plan um, uh, scale, uh, we took the, the, the process from a one liter column to a 10 liter column, which is uh, like a 10 times more uh, uh, material that we were, we were able to process. And under those conditions, we were still able to retain really high levels of conversion in, a, in only 45 minute uh, residence time um, while retaining also good selectivity for the enzyme. So now this process is set to, to be transferred to a 20 liter um, column in our pilot plan campaign uh, really uh, soon, uh, which will allow us to, to be able to uh, target our um, initial quote, uh, quota 
of, of Sarinam information uh, required for, for down, uh, downstream processing uh, to be able to finish the synthesis of the MK1026. So with that, I would like to thank the whole um, MK1026 team um, that was involved in the whole uh, uh, 1026 synthesis, uh, but also the people involved in the enzyme engineering, uh, flow chemistry and immobilization and our external partners at, at Codexis. And with that, I would like uh, to thank you uh, for joining the presentation and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Carla, for the presentation. That was a lot of great work. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mao Nguyen Nguyen, and I'm a global product manager at uh, GenScript. I oversee a mutagenesis portfolio, and I'll be moderating uh, uh, questions for Carla's talk. And uh, we've got a few questions here, so um, let me see. So the first question was, did a large percentage of your combinatory mutagenesis library generate non-functional mutants? Um, that's an excellent question, and depending on the number of mutations that we incorporate into the combinatorial libraries, uh, sometimes we will see that, yes, we generate a lot of uh, non-functional uh, mutations. Uh, we tend to do a lot of, um, we have a bioinformatic team, team that will deconvolute all that information, and they, they could report back to us what mutations are beneficial, what mutations are detrimental for the uh, enzymatic activity. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, what are the advantages of running immobilized reactions in flow versus batch? Um, the biggest advantage of running uh, the reactions in, in flow versus batch, um, so when you run the reactions in flow, in this case, um, you have better control of how much of the starting material is running through your, your column. Um, so you could significantly reduce the amount of byproducts because now your reactions are running more under uh, kinetic control uh, instead of th thermodynamic control. Um, but it also allows allows us to do uh, reduce the number of steps that we have to go through in order to, uh, in terms of when you immobilize the enzyme, all the washes that you have to do, they are happening inside a column. So uh, there's a lot less uh, variations in the process than if you run the reactions in, in, uh, in a batch. Um, another question is, what percentage of library coverage do you screen, and what is the average mutation per library, uh, per variant in the combinatorial libraries? Um, so we typically try to screen for site saturation libraries. We, we try to screen around 40% uh, is it, the library coverage that we will get. Uh, that's like depending on the quality of the, of the library, uh, we, we try to stick with between 24 and 32 96 well plates at a time, so that will give us around 40% coverage. Um, in terms of the combinatorial library, uh, we try to hit around uh, three um, mutations, average mutations per, per clone. Um, it could be as low as one, two, or it could be as high as eight or nine, depending on the number of, of um, mutations that we incorporate in a library. Thank you, Carla. Um, uh, whether libraries constructed using degenerate codons, and if so, did you observe a lot of truncated products due to stop, co stop codons? Yeah, so we use an NNK uh, for, for designing libraries, and um, we, yeah, depending on where the mutations are, we might see uh, a lot of truncation products, but usually we, yeah, from what we have seen, most of the libraries, we try to hit a, a quality or a QC of about, uh, for size saturations, it could be as high as like 85 to 90%. Um, if it's anything less than 60%, we will try to rebuild again uh, because we know we're going to have a, a lot of issues in the screening process. But we, are try, we try to keep a, a good quality control in the libraries and try to hit that seven, between 70 and 80% for the SSM libraries. Color, so I oversee mutagenesis portfolio, so uh, I'm going to piggyback on that uh, question that uh, I want to express that we actually, uh, GenScript offer a precision mutant library service uh, that can help you completely eliminate stop codons. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just keep in mind, uh, that will reduce your screening load. Um, I have uh, one last question. How long does a round of evolution take from library construction to screening? Um, so, 
it, it could take anywhere between, so we do uh, obviously library design, between the bioinformatic team, we would make decisions on the library design. We order oligos, we build the libraries in-house. Uh, we do uh, expression in E. coli, that's our, uh, as, uh, that's our host of, of choice. Um, so expression and then uh, biochemical assays, depending on the biochemical assay that we ended up running, it could be um, the screen, the total screen for a site saturation library could be between a uh, few hours to days if we use uh, LC MS detection. Um, but then after we gather our primary data information, we also do a retest and shape fast powder. Um, so that could take anywhere from two to three weeks to do one round of evolution. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, all the questions that I have for now. Uh, and so thank you again, Carla, and thank you everybody for attending this session. Have a yeah, great thank day. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.